As someone born in the mid-80s, I grew up during the peak of Turtle Mania. I got to watch the original 87 cartoon as it aired. I got to play with the original toys as they came out. Turtle Mania was everywhere, and I was deep into it. I remember my grandmother crocheting me a turtle shell to go along with my Halloween costume. And I even got to see the Ninja Turtles perform live in their Coming Out of Their Shells tour. Yes, they had a concert tour, and it was as cringy as you think. My uh, strongest memory of that entire concert was when the Shredder came out on stage and told everybody that he had locked the doors, and we were all held captive, none of us could leave, and it was up to the Ninja Turtles to save us all through the power of music. It was clearly the height of the Ninja Turtle franchise. But, needless to say, a Ninja Turtle costume was bound to happen at some point. So, here we are. We've got to watch Cretans, because tonight we're making armor to take down those blasted turtles. And I'm craving turtle soup. So, just like any other project, first things first, I'm going to need some reference material. There have been plenty of iterations of this evil cheese grater over the last 40 years, so I had a lot of stuff to choose from. And this being my annual Halloween costume for the roller skating rinks that I go to, um, when choosing the version of Shredder that I wanted to do, I had a lot of criteria that I had to match. Aside from cosplay, roller skating is my other big hobby. So. Halloween really lets me kind of dive into both. And everything being Halloween costume, uh, uh, no pressure if it doesn't look good. It's, it's kind of that time of year when, you know, you can really mess up on a costume and no one's really gonna care, you know what I mean? It kind of gives you the freedom to mess up. As for Shredder, I wasn't really interested in making the most iconic versions, like the 87 cartoon or the original movie. The Shredder spikes on those were too small and the outfits were just way too simple. Uh, classic look, but not my style. Now what originally got me into cosplay was around eight years ago when we got a local sci-fi convention. I had never done cosplay before at that point, but I've always been an arts and crafts guy. So it was cool to see all the local artists selling their crafts and seeing cosplays people had made. And during that weekend, I met up with some co-workers to watch the cosplay contest. And I don't know why, but there were so many Doctor Who costumes that year. It might have been a good year for the show. I've never seen it, so it might have been something really big happening with it that year. But I swear, almost half the contestants were all Doctor Who. <laughs> but my co-worker leaned over to me and said something along the lines of like, dude, you need to enter this next year. With all the stuff that you've done, I bet you could make a cool costume and win this. And I did, like, a lot. But one of the guests that year was a popular cosplayer by the name of Night Mage. And his cosplay, like that super shredder, our jaws hit the floor. We were speechless. We hadn't seen anything that cool so far at the convention. And it blew my mind. I wanted to make something just as cool as that. And I did. For the last seven years of cosplay, I made a lot of cool stuff and had a lot of fun doing it too. And in the off chance that Night Mage ever sees this, um, thank you for inspiring this random guy at a convention that you went to like eight years ago. I know it probably doesn't mean much, but just seeing that in you, it was enough motivation for me to try and get into it and now it's been my full-time hobby and one of my favorite things to do. So again, thank you. <laughs> so in order to bring this Shredder costume around full circle, I wanted to at least honor his Super Shredder. 
I wanted some big spikes. So what about just doing a Super Shredder then? Well, the whole point of Super Shredder is that he's a big muscle man. Uh, <laughs> hence the uh, airbrushed abs in the movie. And I've got a bit of a gut, so that's not going to work out too well. So I need something a little bit different. Uh, after looking around at version after version of the Shredder, I kept going back to this one statue by PCS, uh, Premium Collectible Studios. It's a little more samurai, feudal Japan looking than the rest. Plus he has these really cool hip plates where every other version just has a belt, which sure would be easier to make, but those side plates can probably help hide my gut a little bit or make it look bigger. Who knows? Its design was more aggressive, but it wasn't so exaggerated that it no longer read as the Shredder. Unlike that Michael Bay Shredder. I am Optimus Prime. Now, as far as I'm aware, this version of Shredder is entirely brand new. Um, it's not from any media, movies, comic books, or anything like that or at least that I can find. So this means this whole project is going to have to be done freehand, which means that my only source of reference are these stock photos, and that's it. So during my free time at work, I took a ton of notes and made sure that I broke down exactly how every piece of armor would work and how it fit before I started this project. For the chest, this was a standard duct tape template. This is achieved with a body cast. We start by wrapping the section needed, in this case my chest, with plastic wrap. And once that's all wrapped up, I cover that plastic wrap in duct tape. This would have been a lot easier with some help, but I had a mirror and some cameras, so I managed. Once I got as much as I could covered, I cut the cast free, and I started drawing my design out on the cast. I only needed to focus on the one side because I could later just flip the template for the other side. Once I had everything all drawn out the way I wanted, I made sure to add any alignment markings needed, and I numbered the pieces so I knew what order they went into. The front was labeled with an F, and the back was labeled with a B. F1, F2, B1, B2, for example. With all that done, I cut the pieces out and transferred them to cardstock paper. This way the pattern would be consistent between the left and right sides. But also, because I actually managed to save my templates this time, um, I will be trying to digitize them, so if I manage to do that, there will be a link in the description for the templates for the entire suit. With all the template pieces cut to cardstock, I did what I normally do with my templates. I assembled them first, before transferring them to foam. That way I could make whatever adjustments I needed and try on the paper template to check all the bends. This also gives me an idea on what angle cuts I would need after transferring this to foam. Once I was happy with the shape that I had, it came time to transfer everything to EVA foam. This project used leftover EVA foam from my last two projects. The uh, black foam is from Hobby Lobby. It was five millimeters and the white foam was from Michael's and it was six millimeters. On the chest, I don't believe I made any angles deeper than a 45, that being a straight cut joined up with an angle cut. The idea was that this would create pressure in those segments across the chest, making the seams pop outward a little bit. With everything cut out, then came time to glue. This is just your basic contact cement by Weldwood that can be bought in any hardware section. I gave it a thin layer to all edges, then allowed it to dry for a few minutes, then pressed it all together. As long as your contact cement hasn't gone bad, when bonded together, the seal should be stronger than the foam itself. Meaning if you try to break that seal afterwards, you'll just rip the foam. And with both left and right sides glued, I joined the two sides together. At this point, the front and back aren't connected yet, mostly because I was still weighing my options for how to join them together. 
Up next would be the shoulders. This was the same process as before, but with one additional step. I started by layering pieces of aluminum foil on my shoulder. I built up the layers and molded the foil to a shape larger than my actual shoulder. The armor plate isn't form fitting, so I had to mold it to shape, adding layers and layers of foil until I had something close to the shape that I wanted. Once I was ready, now the process became the same as the last. I wrapped my foil in plastic wrap and then duct tape on top of that. Then I drew my design on the duct tape. I wasn't 100% sure yet if these plates should be symmetrical side to side, so I made sure to transfer both front and back to the cardstock. And as I thought, there was a significant difference between the two. So I opted to use both the front and the back so that the pauldrons would contour my shoulder perfectly. And once again, once the paper template was assembled, I tried it on and made any adjustments I felt necessary. Once that was done, came time to do the inner plates because these pauldrons are a three-piece design. This was freehanded in cardstock paper and involved a lot of guesswork until I got the pieces to line up and bend the way that I wanted them to. And then came time to transfer everything to foam, cutting everything out, and gluing it all together, making sure to invert the template for the other shoulder and making sure to mark the front and back so I know which way they face later on.
after these were assembled, I didn't yet attach the three pieces. For the moment, I just had them taped together. And then I focused on the blades on the shoulder. I more or less made an artistic guess on the size and shape and angles needed for them and drew them out in the side profile. Once I had what I wanted, I then transferred them to foam. That'd be eight blades total, four large for the top and four small for the bottom. At this point, I just cut them out of 10 millimeter Hobby Lobby EVA foam. I'll be detailing them later in bulk once I cut out the blades for the rest of the pieces. Up next would be the gauntlets. I used the aluminum foil from the shoulders and reshaped it to what I needed for my forearm, then adding extra aluminum foil to get the rest of the shape that I needed. And then I did yet another duct tape template. Once that was ready, I traced out my design, cut out the pattern, and transferred that to cardstock. At this time, I also designed the additional pieces that fit around the top and bottom of the gauntlet. Well, once Sable lets me. Once I was happy with all that, then I transferred it all to EVA foam and then cut that out. With all pieces cut out and glued together, I focused on making the blades for this as well. There would be four blade sizes in this one, small, medium, and large for the gauntlet, and a very large blade for the hands. I transferred these to 10 millimeter foam as well, and I set those blades aside for later. For the shins, I used the same exact step again, including the same exact leftover aluminum foil. I reshaped the foil and added more to get the shape needed for the shin armor. Once I had what I needed, I once again created another duct tape template and traced out the pattern onto the duct tape. When that was all good, I transferred that all to foam and then glued it all together.
And after that, I started freehanding the knee template. And once those were all made up, came time to clean up everything that I'd made so far. I got out my Dremel tool, cleaning up any bad seams and rounding off my edges. I then added straps around the back of the shins and made some fake belt buckles. These will end up attached around the back of the shin with Velcro. Then I brought back out all my blades for the long and tedious task of dremeling and sharpening all 24 pieces. To make the process a little faster, I started by carving the blades first with an X-Acto knife by following the trace lines I originally had on my template. Once all 24 were carved, then I brought out my little portable dremel booth made of glued together insulation foam and spent the next few hours smoothing everything out, along with all other additional armor pieces that I haven't done yet, rounding all the edges and cleaning any bad seams. I then made little pieces of trim for the bottom of the blades to help make sure that they stay a little more secure when inserted. And I started marking and cutting out where I wanted those blades to be in those pieces. This was mostly guesswork, but I also did my best to make sure the blades didn't touch and seemed somewhat uniform. After all the blades were attached, I then went ahead and finished all the small bits that I had made previously for the gauntlets. And while still working on the gauntlets, I went ahead and started working on the mounting hardware for the gauntlets. I started by adding an internal elevated base for the gauntlet. This had two purposes. One, to make my forearms seem more bulky. And two, to hopefully create more clearance for the hand blades to move without interference. And while I was at it, I also made the straps that help secure the gauntlets to my forearms. Just like the shin pieces, these are one inch wide strips that were glued into place and cut to size with room to overlap. At this point, I wasn't really liking the placement of the spikes. After several test fits, the fact that they weren't even close to the figure I was referencing drove me nuts. I wanted them to look more deadly and usable. I wanted the points of all of them sticking up so that each individual tip could be touched and start a cut. But the only way to address this was to cut them off completely. I was hesitant to do this at first because of how little time I had left in the build, but once something like this bothers me, I can't sit idle on it, 
Fortunately, it was an easy decision to make because I had something else I needed to address too. The surface of the gauntlet wasn't even what I wanted either. On the source material, the curves are very angular, and my cuts didn't give me the bulge that I wanted in those seams. Plus, after cutting off the blades, the surface was no longer smooth, and it's not like the blades are going back in the same spot. And so it came time to bring out my trusty foam clay. Um, if you saw my last video, you saw how much I loved this stuff. Um, I won't go into detail about it here, but I'll put a link in the description for the video where I go into full detail on how much I like this foam clay. I used the clay to sculpt out the lines I needed to get the gauntlet a lot closer to the design of the source material. Once that was all done, I made new thinner trim for the base of the blades. Once they were in place, I then started working on the new placement for the blades. The foam clay was still wet and would still take another 48 hours to fully dry, which is why I did this while it was still wet. After gluing the spikes in place, I pushed the foam clay up against the blade trim and whatever gaps we left after the clay dried, I would just deal with later when sealing all the pieces. Up next are the hip plates. I used some new aluminum foil this time and laid down several layers on my hip. I wanted the top portion to bend outward, so I made sure to have a portion up on my hip to get that bend. After a couple more layers of foil to help hold the shape, I started my duct tape template process with some plastic wrap followed by duct tape. Once that shape was in place, came time to draw the pattern. I used some existing blades I had at the time to get an idea of placement. These blades will be borrowed for the hips. I finished drawing out my template design, then cut out the pieces and transferred them to paper. Just like the pauldrons, I'm using the whole thing. The front half and back half wrap around my leg and midsection differently, so using the whole template will help it fit more snug. I transferred these all out the foam, making sure to add angle cuts to the curves so that those seams would have a peak. And once the pieces were all assembled, I made another template for the trim. Once I was happy with what I had, I transferred that to foam as well and glued it all to the hip plates. And from there came time to do even more blades. 12 blades total, and 12 blade trim pieces total. On a side note, while making these, I noticed that the uh, hip plates actually look almost like turtle shells. While the plating is supposed to be metal, it is pretty cool that the plating on his armor looks kind of like the shells of his enemies. Almost like they're the shells of his victims, you know? <laughs> cool little detail. And with the blades on, the hips are now done, on to the next part. Up next would be the cod piece. For this, I used the same exact aluminum foil that I used on the hips and molded that to shape. And just like the other pieces, I used plastic wrap and duct tape to make a duct tape template. And once the shape was wrapped in duct tape, I brought my magic marker again 
and drew out the lines for all the pieces on the plating. Once I had all the pieces out that I needed for the template, I then transferred them to cardstock. This piece was probably the hardest out of all the pieces so far to kind of freehand, because if you look at the original plating on the figure, it looks like it used to be one piece that was then split in two. So I had to kind of find that uniform flow to it while also keeping everything in shape, both height and width. So needless to say that there was a ton of construction, reconstruction, and trial and error just to get this shape exactly as I wanted it to. This mostly involved more duct tape, wrapping around the end, drawing what I wanted, and then cutting the shape out by hand. Once I had all the pieces that I needed, I then transferred them out to foam and cut them to shape. Once they were all cut out, I applied contact cement and pressed them all together. And from there, I started working on the back plate that this would be on. I originally had already marked out how wide I needed it to be and what shape while working with the actual template itself. But I also needed to do the trimming as well. So I traced that template out, made a trim for it. And once the trim was glued together, I made sure to dremel the edges round before I attached it to the whole piece. Once all the plating was then dremeled up, I then took a ton of contact cement and attached everything to the back plate. And after that was all assembled, I did a quick test fit with the hip plates in the center piece to get an idea to make sure everything was fitting right and within the right proportions. I attached the side pieces on with some duct tape onto my t-shirt and then just held up the center piece by hand. Around this time, I realized that the center piece was way too wide. I had to bring it in probably about two inches or so. And what I ended up doing was I took the front center piece, flipped it around backwards, and then held it in place and drew around how wide I wanted it to be and what shape I needed it to be to kind of bring it closer to the reference material. That way I knew how much I needed to cut off, which was quite a lot. And before I could sit back down to work, Sable took my chair, so I had to pick her up and give her some attention. And now with my new lines all drawn out on the back of the uh, template, I made sure to separate everything as best I could, which I did pretty good, and then started cutting down on the base plate to get it to the shape and size that I needed. And because I was trying to save all my templates, I made sure to transfer that change to the new template, and then I transferred that to new foam. And from here, started all over again. Made another template for the trim, cut out all of my pieces from the original plating, and shrunk all that down as well. More or less starting all over. But this time around, everything turned out way better. Everything was proportional, it looked right in terms of sizing, and I managed to save it all in templates. Alright, so up next are the shoe covers. Um, before I actually talk about how I made the shoe covers, I want to go into depth of how they actually work. Also, if you hear any rattling, um, I'll go into it later, but every little rivet on this armor, just like any other armor piece, is googly eyes. So inside here, Googly eyes. So, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the video, I roller skate. These are my Rydell 951s. Um, I won't go into complete detail on them, but they are on some Powerdyne Reactor Pro Neos. Uh, wheels are vanilla backspin Eclipse, I think. They're aluminum hub ones, the, the good ones. Uh, as for this big bulky bit in the bottom, that's a battery. I have light up skates. <laughs> it's an aftermarket kit, um, Bluetooth controlled. 
So when it comes to costumes and stuff too, I can match the color. So with these, I had them set to purple to go along with my Shredder costume. Anyway, going off topic, disconnecting that, that's a distraction. Um, expensive skates, these are custom made. The Rydell 951s, they are, they are only custom ordered. You cannot buy these without a custom order um, because they are custom color ordered. You can get different fabric types, different colors. Um, I'm probably the only crazy person to ever go all black suede just all black in general. Um, <laughs> the rink owner's face, when I showed him my paper for what I wanted for this, he looked at me like I was crazy. Uh, he's like, why do you want all black? Well, two reasons, actually. Reason number one, I wear all black. Reason number two, um, I've been making costumes for my roller skating rinks for years now, actually. Um, every year I make a costume for Halloween and having a black pair of skates underneath anything allows you to hide the shoe itself. It's all black, and you don't see anything under whatever you're putting on top of it. Um, same when you're wearing a costume to, for Halloween or for conventions, wear all black underneath, only your armor's gonna be seen. I'm rambling, so why am I talking about this? These have what we call a lace cover. So, laces are here, these protect the laces. Uh, I don't know so much protect them, it just looks fancy. Velcro is right on top. So, these are called lace covers. You can buy them individually from Rydell, but they have, I think like two different designs, or if you want to just change these out, or if they go bad, you just order another pair of lace covers. Pretty cool. So the way these work then, is along the laces right here, there's Velcro and on the inside is also Velcro, right along the edges. The reason I like this and the reason I wanted them for this is because when it comes time to doing any kind of shoe cover now or a costume, literally all I have to do is just make a foam lace cover. So these here, this table's not even. Um, there's now Velcro on the inside of this. So once I put my shoe on, I just slap this on top of my toe, like so, press it on, it's not coming off without a lot of force. It's great. Uh, <laughs> when I explained it to them at the rink, how this actually worked, they're like, that is genius. I'm like, I know, pat me on the back. But yeah, there's probably other routes, but if, why, why am I giving advice for roller skating cosplay for like no one who's ever gonna see this that's actually into both? But if you were doing it, try to find a pair of roller skates that actually have lace covers and you will be all set to make your own fake lace covers for your costumes. Anyway, back to the build. So just like every other piece, I needed to make a duct tape template first. This just involves wrapping the entire shoe in plastic wrap and then again in duct tape. And I started off by tracing the shape of the lace cover itself. That way I could get a general idea of where the Velcro would end up being and to keep the whole thing center. Once I had that all drawn on, I then secured the template onto the shoe with a little bit more tape and then drew out the shape of the plating. Originally the shoe plating was going to be a double plate design. Um, I later converted it down to just one piece just for simplicity. But with the plates all drawn out, I cut out the duct tape template and transferred it to paper so that I could later use it as a paper template. And because your shoe is slightly different from left to right, I made sure to write an inner and outer, and then I would invert all that for the other foot. I then transferred those templates out to foam, cut everything out, applied some contact cement, and then pressed them all together. And once I had the basic shape down for the top part of the shoe cover, I needed to do the tip of the toe as well. Um, this was the same exact process again, more plastic wrap, more duct tape, more duct tape templates. 
The tip of the toe has this blade up here that leads up to it. Um, I can't get that with uh, just a regular duct tape template, so I had to build that shape up too. So what I did first was after building the duct tape template, I used some cardstock and drew out the shape of how far I wanted this peak in the center to be. And once I had that drawn out and cut out, I attached it to the toe of the shoe and I started building up the shape from that on top of the duct tape template. And once I had that general shape made, I then transferred that to cardstock paper. And once the paper template was made, I then transferred that to EVA foam and then cut those pieces out. Making sure that that front center peak had a nice 45 degree cut angle in it to make sure that when it was bound together, it made a very sharp point. And once they are both assembled, I did a quick mock-up to make sure that the top of the shoe and the toe of the shoe were fitting together okay. And then brought up my Dremel and started working on my edges before I glued everything together. Once those edges were all smooth, then came time to bring out the contact cement and bind those pieces together. I don't show it in the video. I must not have recorded it, but there was a very last minute change where I did end up cutting this deep V out in front. Um, this was more of a fitment issue. Uh, there was a fitment issue for two reasons. Um, first off, uh, if I'm doing any kind of lean forward leaning, my foot needs to be able to bend. This would open up some room for my actual shin to squeeze in there. And uh, second, the actual shin armor right there kind of comes down to a point. So I didn't want them to constantly rub each other. So this alleviated some of that contact that they had, uh, gave me a little bit more gap right there, allowed me to get a lot more movement out of my ankles. Um, yeah, which is something we'll get into in a future episode where, um, before you do any painting, sealing or anything, always test fit, make sure fitment is great, but I'll get into that in another episode. In the meantime, uh, we're going to cut this episode right here. Up next, I'm going to have an episode for the helmet all by itself. And then after that, we will do fitment. We'll do fitment, sewing, and painting. And hopefully I can keep this all in three episodes, just like last year's Halloween project for the RoboCop. You haven't seen that one? Uh, I guess I'll put a link somewhere or something. So, see you in the next one.